And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And that's talking about the two witnesses and how that, again, that's the first time you see the beast ever mentioned in the book of Revelation. And that's in chapter 11. And then when we go on from there, there's the two witnesses, they're killed. And when it mentions the beast, notice I told you that the Bible interprets the Bible. And here's a perfect example of it. The first time a beast is really mentioned in the Bible in a big degree is when the serpent, remember in the Garden of Eden, in Genesis chapter 3, the serpent was the most subtle beast of the field, more subtle than any of the beasts. And everything in Revelation, you're going to notice, it's going to really amaze you because Revelation has over 200 references to the Old Testament. And this is just one of them. Remember, Jesus appears like a lamb with seven eyes and seven horns, and he redeems people by his blood in Revelation chapter 5. Well, that's the Passover lamb in Exodus that redeemed Israel when they put the blood on the door. And I'm going to actually show you a little bit more about that as we go along. But even beast is referring here. And remember in Revelation 1, no, actually Revelation 4, there's a rainbow round about the throne where God is sitting. Well, the rainbow takes you back, for example, to Noah and his story. And remember when Noah came to the top of Mount Ararat, he had to travel in the ark through water. And then, like an island, Mount Ararat would have been sticking up out of the water because the water was all over the world and only the mountain peaks started showing first. So picture that like an island with a rainbow there and the ark is going. Well, in Revelation chapter 4, John sees a throne and there's a rainbow around it and there's a sea of glass in front of it. All this water that's so still it looked like glass. And then in chapter 5, Jesus is walking on the water to get to that throne. It's so neat because he walked on the water on the earth, and then this vision in heaven, he's walking on water again. But that's just some examples of how everything in Revelation, there's a message in it using pictures from the Old Testament. So this beast that's mentioned in Revelation 11, God intends us to think back in the Bible, okay, what's there about a beast? And the first thing you read about way back in Genesis, that this serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. And that brought death to mankind. So here is man's enemy, that's a beast, and you've got the same thing at the end of the Bible, Revelation, the first one, Genesis, and the last one, Revelation. And the Lord showed me years ago that Everything in the first few chapters of Genesis is like a seed planted, and then it's harvested in Revelation. And you've even got the tree of life at the beginning in, in Genesis, and there's the tree of life in Revelation 22, where the throne of God has a river coming out of it, and the tree of life on either side. So you get all these parallels. And this beast, just like you find about in Revelation, this beast in the garden, that serpent, wanted Eve to become like God. Mankind becoming like God. And you actually see that in the book of Revelation with the beast. But instead of becoming like God, we find out that mankind went backwards and became more like beasts. And uh, when God came and saw them naked... And you know how they had sewn together fig leaf aprons for themselves? And then, as if they solved the problem, they got the fig leaves aprons because they were naked, and now they were ashamed. When before they sinned, they were naked and were not ashamed. God, here the, he approaches them, Adam, where are you? And he hid himself. And if you look at it, he said, why did you hide yourself? And Adam says, because we were naked. And, and here you read it that they just clothed themselves with aprons. And there's kind of a little thing I like to throw in every time I refer to that. Mankind thinks he solves his own problems like Adam and Eve. 
made themselves those aprons. And they finished because they thought the work was done. But then when the word of God came, they heard God's voice. That's the word of God. Then they realized they weren't okay like they thought they were and hid themselves. And God had to clothe them and he clothed them with animal skins. And so here you got mankind going from this state of innocence because of sin. They were now ashamed of themselves and God clothed them with beasts, animal skins. So you could see man going backwards, you know, and then remember God said, if the, you eat the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, you're going to die. And then sure enough, when they eat it, then God says, you're going back to the dust. Dust thou art and unto dust shalt thou return again. And instead of going on to live forever, it's like he's going backwards and going back to the ground where he came from. It's like everything's gone in reverse. And so man really is becoming more like beasts than he was to go higher. And then it was all a result of that devil lying to him. Now you remember Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter four, Nebuchadnezzar exalted himself and he actually became like an animal and a beast watch this here hope everybody can see that if again if you can't see that clearly head up there for speaker view and it'll fill your screen the same hour was the thing fulfilled upon nebuchadnezzar and he was driven from men and look at this just like a beast he did eat grass as an oxen and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hairs were grown like eagle's feathers. First, he eats grass like an ox. Then, his hair is like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. See how sin, it's kind of making man go backwards. And really, Nebuchadnezzar got demon-possessed when this happened. If you read all around this, it said, they made him do this and they made him do that. And you wonder who they are and it's devils. And so, in Revelation, when it talks about the beast, he's from a pit, which would be like an abyss. And demons in the demoniac, remember when Jesus was casting the devils of the demoniac at Gadara? And they said, we're legion for we are many. They said, are you going to cast us into the deep before our time or into the pit? So you know when you compare Bible with Bible that this beast that comes from the pit is from the same place where the demons didn't want to go. That's where they came from. And praise God, aren't you glad they're going to go back in the pit again one day? Hallelujah. And now, how many have ever seen pictures like this about the mark of the beast? You saw all that? This is what's popularly understood to be the mark. And like a barcode and all of that. And... Uh, if you look in that woman's eyes really close, I don't know how big your screen is, but you can see the word beast in her eyes. And then, is that the mark of the beast? Is that what the mark of the beast is going to be? We're going to answer these kind of questions. And then, here's another one. What's the mark of the beast? And a guy's got a picture here. That mark in Greek is karagma. The karagma of the beast. And it's a stamp, an impression, or an engraving. And so... There you got 666 on his hand and on his forehead and his name or the number on his forehead. So is that something going to be printed on our foreheads or on our hands? Well, we'll answer those questions too. And then how many heard this? The RFID chip or radio frequency identification chip. They think that's going to be the mark of the beast. Where you put that in your hand and then it sends out a frequency and people can scan it and all those type of things and so this guy whoever made this is saying don't take the rfid chip <laughs> so is that it you know or how many have ever heard of bitcoin you heard of bitcoin and cryptocurrency and they think that's all associated with the mark of the beast and then they got in the middle that's the euro it's two euros and some people think the european common market you know is where the beast and the antichrist is going to come and all these different ideas, and then there's another one. You get that, I think they call them QSR symbols, shows on the hand, and then there's that RFID technology chip and barcode and all these different ideas. And 
here's another opinion of what the mark of the beast might be. How many ever heard of Ash Wednesday? <laughs> and in a lot of churches, and I think mostly the Catholic Church does this, they put ashes on your forehead in the shape of a cross, and some people think that's the mark of the beast, and they, they talk about the Catholic Church. And then here's a, here's a recent one. People are worried about 5G, you know, the telephones, the, the cell phones and 5G technology, and, and then COVID-19 and the New World Order or the NWO. And people are thinking, have you heard this? The COVID vaccine is supposed to be the Antichrist, according to some people. And there's another one, the COVID, this, whoever made this thinks the COVID vaccine is the mark of the beast right there. Now, when you stop and think about it, the mark of the beast is associated with worshiping a human being, a man, not worshiping God. You've got to take all the details of what Revelation says about it. If you're going to find something that you think is the mark, then you've got to make sure, well, is worship involved in this? And so I'm asking everybody that thinks the vaccine's the mark of the beast, how's that worship to a man? Like some people I've said this to, well, it, they're making you do it. You know, you're not going to be able to maybe buy if you don't have this vaccine. And the mark of the beast, you have to have to buy or sell. Okay, well, what about the worship part, though? Where's the worship involved? You know, how are you worshiping a man and not God by taking a COVID vaccine? See, it doesn't fit. You've got to go by all the details. People are only thinking of the mark of the beast on the forehead or the hand, and they're thinking about buying or selling. And then they tie that together and think, well, you might not be able to buy. They might not let you into stores. You know, maybe you'll get a COVID passport type of thing, and you've heard about that on the news. But they don't think of the other details like the worship of a man. It's just not there with a COVID-19 vaccine. And then this one, <laughs> please excuse me, but I literally laughed at this one. The certificate of vaccination identification is the mark of the beast, they said. And if you can read that small lettering underneath, he claims, and there's the picture of the man in the corner, that the name COVID-19, here's where it came from. C is the third letter in the alphabet, A, B, C. And in Strong's Concordance, number three is Abaddon or Apollyon. And, and Apollyon and Abaddon is in, I think it's in the Revelation chapter 9, and he's got the key to the bottomless pit. And uh, he's like the destroyer. And so they say C has something to do with Abaddon in the Greek. And then instead of saying O means something and V means something, they just said, wait a minute, Ovid. Ovid is a word that means sheep. So C, Ovid, COVID. And in, in Strong's Concordance, sheep has something to do with slaughter. But th these things are absolutely ridiculous. Who said that? Could, how many of you ever heard this before? Every flu is actually called a COVID. They're all called COVID, all the flus. So how come they didn't say that when 10 years ago, Johnny got the flu and had to stay home from school? And then he, he maybe got a flu vaccine or a flu shot. They didn't call that the mark of the beast, but why is this COVID all of a sudden called the mark of the beast? You see, see, it's really funny. Unfortunately, these people are thinking that's what it's talking about in the Bible, but really, when you look at these things, it's kind of laughable. And here's another one. There's that radio frequency ID chip again, and they think that's the mark of the beast and so forth. And there it is, COVID-19. Bill Gates is supposed to say that there's going to be a little tiny microchip inserted through the vaccine. And he was actually talking about that. But where's the worship of a man in that? You see, you've got to go by everything the Bible says concerning these things. Now, when we read about the mark in Revelation 13 and 18, watch this carefully. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. Now notice, it didn't say let him who is going to have understanding count the number, because John wrote that 2,000 years ago, right? And 2,000 years ago, 
If it wasn't going to happen in his day, and it's supposed to happen in our day, John would have said, let him that has wisdom in that future, let him that is going to have wisdom count the number. But John said right in his day, if you're reading this and you get wisdom, you'll know the number of the beast. You'll know. And John wrote it as though people in his day should understand that. And watch this. A lot of people never noticed this before, but in Revelation 1 and 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is the very first verse in the entire book of Revelation. And look what it says. It's a revelation of Jesus, which God gave to him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. Now we're 2000 years after John wrote that. So if God was showing John things that are shortly going to come to pass, then 2,000 years isn't shortly come to pass. I mean, that's a long time after John wrote this. And this is the very first verse. I've shown this to people. I said, you know, according to this verse, the things that John wrote about were supposed to happen just shortly after he wrote them. And, and we're 2,000 years later. And they said, well, but in God's eyes... 2,000 years is just a short time. Well, if this is a revelation and God is revealing something, he's making something known, then he's not going to speak from perspectives of his that we don't relate to. Shortly come to pass, if he's saying he's got one way of thinking about shortly come to pass and we've got a different way, that's only causing confusion. No, when the Bible said it was shortly to come to pass, it was. And you're going to be amazed. I'm going to show you some history where a lot of this. Now, hold on. I don't know if you heard this before. I think Brother Murdoch, he, he's heard me get into some of this stuff before. But I'm going to show you where a lot of this happened a long time ago. And history proves it. It's going to be amazing. Watch this. So not only does it say it in verse 1, it would shortly come to pass. But verse 2 says, who bear record of the word of God, of the testimony of Jesus Christ, and of all things that he saw. And look at verse 3. He says it again. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written, for the time is at hand. Hallelujah. I'm feeling the Holy Ghost because I know what I'm going to say here in a few minutes. Shortly come to pass, the time is at hand. Oh my. Now, Fifth, about 400 years before John, that's when Daniel wrote the book of Daniel, right? And Daniel, last chapter of Daniel, chapter 12, he sees all these visions, and a lot of these visions are in the book of Revelation. And Daniel, when he's watching them, he says, I heard, but I understood not. And he said, Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, go thy way, Daniel. And notice this, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Look at those words I made bold and underlined. Words are sealed until the time of the end. Now, did you ever notice it doesn't say the end of time? It says the time of the end. There's an end of something that was going to happen. What's that end? We, he doesn't say. It just says, in other words, Daniel, it's not for you. It's not you, you right now alive in your day, these things aren't going to affect you. So I want you to close them up. They're sealed because in the time of the end, that is when this is going to be affecting people. And in verse 10, he says, many are going to be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Now, remember what we read about the mark of the beast? Let him that hath wisdom count the number of the beast but 500 years or 400 years before john when daniel wrote it it was sealed because it wasn't for his day and he says later on at the time of the end there's going to be wise people that will understand daniel but you don't need to concern yourself it's not for you now when we go to the last chapter of revelation like we just read the last chapter of Daniel, Jesus tells Daniel, 
seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Now he told Daniel to seal it. Go your way, Daniel, seal it. It's for the time of the end. But here he talks about sealing, and he talks about the time, but he says it in very different words. He says, seal not. That's completely opposite to what Daniel was told. And why was Daniel told to seal it? Because it wasn't for him. It was for the time of the end. But John is told, don't seal it. For the time is at hand. Now, if Daniel was said, you seal it till the time of the end. And John was told, don't seal it because the time is at hand. That's the time of the end that he's talking about. And it was so close to John that he wasn't supposed to seal it. And only four, 400 years before John, Daniel was told to seal it. So you picture this. Here's Daniel. Seal it. It's not for you. It's for the time of the end. Go 400 years. Here's Daniel. Daniel, or I'm sorry, John. John, don't seal it. The time is at hand. And how many years has it been from John until us? 2,000 years? If Daniel only lived 400 years earlier than John, what's 400 years if the time of the end is actually 2,000 years from John? It's just like adding a, a little quarter to it, you know? And so there's something here that I noticed one day studying the Bible, and then I found out a whole bunch of preachers were starting to see the same thing, that this Mark of the Beast business was way back in John's time. Like, I, I'm going to show you some amazing thing. Now, I know it's not popular. I know on TV you're going to see it's the COVID virus, you know, and it's the vaccine, and it's the, the, the UPC code on the forehead, universal product code, or it's the RFID chip. But here, we're seeing that this stuff was supposed to be shortly after John heard about it. Now, watch as we go on. Something else God showed me when I was studying Revelation. And this was like in the 90s, God was showing me a lot of these things. How many ever noticed that when you read about the plagues in Egypt, they're very similar to the plagues in Revelation? Remember, you got water turning to blood. That's in Revelation. You got um, hailstones falling, the weight of a talent. You got hailstones turning into fire in Egypt and darkness so dark you could feel it and and you get all these plagues and they're the, so similar in both exodus when it happened to egypt and the seals the trumpets and the vials of revelation and revelation 12 just before chapter 13 remember the beast was first mentioned in chapter 11 well then chapter 12 you've got a bunch of details i'll be showing you and and the Lord showed me, said, Mike, look carefully at Revelation. And then I saw the same pattern in Exodus. And then through that, God was able to help me understand what the mark of the beast is. And I'd never heard anybody do that. I'd never heard a guy take Exodus and parallel it with Revelation. But you're not going to believe how many little details in Exodus are found in Revelation even when it gets to this issue of the mark. And it blew my mind when I saw it. You know how, has anybody ever seen a picture of Pharaoh? Where he's got this crown on, and there's a serpent beside a, a falcon or an eagle or something. A serpent right beside an eagle, and that's on his crown. Well, in Exodus, Pharaoh represents the dragon that you see in Revelation or the serpent. He's got a serpent right on his crown. And, and I noticed that. And here, that was just the icing, or rather the tip of the iceberg when I started continue reading. And then the man-child that you read about in Revelation 12, and I'll show you these verses in a minute, he corresponds to Moses in the Old Testament. And Jesus Aren't you glad Jesus is the greater deliverer? Moses was only a foreshadow of Jesus Christ. Praise God. Hallelujah. So look at this. Here's Revelation 12. We're coming up to chapter 13 in the Mark of the Beast. There appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman. Think of this about this woman. 
And here she's clothed with the sun, and the moon's under her feet, and on her head is a crown of 12 stars. Can anybody think, you can use your microphone here too, can anybody think of something in the Old Testament where you've got the sun, the moon, and 12 stars? Anybody remember something like that? I'll give you a hint. It was in a dream. Sun. Joseph. Right. Joseph. And, and Joseph had a dream of the sun and the moon and stars bowing down to him, right? And who were the sun and the moon and the stars? It was Joseph's mother and father and brothers. He had 11 brothers. Him would be 12. And this woman has got a crown of 12 stars. The sun's under her feet. She's clothed with the moon, or clothed rather with the sun and the moon's under her feet. Joseph was describing his family, Israel. The 12 tribes and his mom and dad were Israel. And man, I feel the Holy Ghost because this woman is representing Israel in Revelation chapter 12. And look what it says about her. In verse 2, she's being with child, cried, travailing in birth, pained to be delivered. How many know Jesus was born in Israel? That's the mother giving birth to this child, Jesus. Man, how many, I'm feeling the Holy Ghost just talking about this. And listen to this, there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon Remember I said Pharaoh represents this dragon? In a minute, I'm going to show you details from Exodus and details from Revelation and show you how they're perfectly parallel. And this is how God opens his word up. You're not supposed to go to the newspapers to find out what the mark of the beast is. Go to the rest of the Bible. All these visions in Revelation are Old Testament pictures that God's showing John that are symbolic of what was going to happen in John's day. Hallelujah. That's why I put that little video at the beginning. Bible interprets Bible. Hallelujah. The Bible's a self-contained book. You don't have to leave it and go to the newspapers to learn anything about anything. Not the mark of the beast, not who the beast is or anything. The Bible tells you everything. Hallelujah. And I feel a witness in the Holy Ghost ever since the Lord showed me that. And, and people say, I, that makes sense. One woman was watching our videos and goes to another denomination here in Portage. And she watched me saying that. She said, why didn't we ever think of that before? The Bible interprets the Bible. Hallelujah. So here you get this woman. This baby's going to be born. Israel is going to bring forth Jesus. And then this dragon is waiting there. It's got seven heads, ten horns, and seven crowns on his head. And this dragon's tail draws a third part of the stars of heaven, casts them to the earth, and the dragon stands before this woman, which was ready to be delivered, to devour her child as soon as it was born. Look at how that parallels Exodus. Chapter 1 of Exodus, verse 15. The king of Egypt, Pharaoh who had that serpent on his crown, spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of one was Shephra, and the name of the other was Pua. And he said, when you do the service of a midwife to the Hebrew women and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, then you shall kill him. And if it be a daughter, then she shall live. Doesn't that sound a lot like the dragon? is standing before the woman to devour that man-child as soon as it's born. And Pharaoh is doing this in Exodus through these women that he, since he commanded these midwives to do this, it was him, in effect, really doing it. He was behind it all. And the dragon is waiting for Israel to bring forth Jesus. And so Moses, what happens? Moses' mother takes him and puts him in a bulrush basket, an ark, and floats him down the Nile River, and it floats into Egypt, right? It's so interesting, the faith of God that Moses' mother had, because 
uh, Pharaoh was drowning babies in that very same Nile River where she takes her baby Moses, puts him in a little ark and lets him float down the river and he floats on into Egypt. And that's why the Bible tells us we don't walk by sight, we walk by faith. If, if Moses' mother walked by sight and she looked and saw that Nile River with there might have been little babies floating there. The alligators might have been devouring. I mean, who knows what it might have looked like to her. She would never have done it. But she didn't matter what things looked like. She put her baby right there. But instead of it, man, the Lord's showing me something right now. Instead of those babies dying in that Nile, her baby lived. The other ones died. Remember the flood of Noah? The same water that killed all the sinners saved Noah because he was inside an ark. Man, Brother Murdoch, I think I got another sermon for this weekend. <laughs> I never saw that before in the Holy Ghost. Praise God. But that's how you see things in the spirit where he goes right into Egypt, right under the nose of Pharaoh, who is wanting him dead. He's being raised up and Moses becomes a great leader. Look at this, Exodus chapter 2, verse 1. There went a man of the house of Levi and took to wife a daughter of Levi. And the woman conceived and bare a son. This is Moses being born of Moses' mother. And when she saw that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. And when she could no longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes, daubed it with slime and pitch, and put the child therein, and she laid it in the flags by the river's brink. And his sister, who was Miriam, stood afar off to wit what would be done with him. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river, and her maidens walked alongside by the river's side. And when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. Now look at when Jesus was born in Matthew chapter 2, verse 12. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod. Remember the wise men? Herod said, you go find out what house he's in, in Bethlehem. He told them it's going to be in Bethlehem. But I don't know which house. So when you find it, you tell me. And God said, don't return to Herod, wise men. They departed into their own country another way. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Here's another Joseph having another dream saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee where? Into Egypt. Exactly where Moses in the little ark floated into to get safe from the murdering massacre. Jesus flees into Egypt with Joseph. And be thou there until I bring thee word, for Herod's going to seek your young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night, departed into Egypt, and there he was till the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord of the prophets, saying, Out of Egypt I have called my son. Watch how this leads up to the mark of the beast. Like, this is all in Revelation 12, just before chapter 13. And you need to read that before you get into chapter 13, or you'll miss it. And Herod, just like Pharaoh, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, he was exceeding wroth, sent forth, and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem, and in all the coasts thereof, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, In Ramah was a voice heard, lamentation and weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and would not be comforted because they are not. And in Revelation 12, verse 5, this woman brings forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Just like Moses is going to rule in Egypt. Just This is Jesus it's talking about. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And what you just saw happen here was the writer of Revelation went from the birth of Jesus right through past the cross and the death, the burial, and the resurrection, past 40 more days when Jesus preached for 40 days about the kingdom, when he ascended up into heaven and sat on the throne. It's like Revelation chapter 12 in one verse. 
went all the way from the birth of Jesus till he went to the throne of God, throne of heaven, almighty, hallelujah. The Lord said unto my Lord in Psalm 110, sit thou at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And I've been preaching, preaching to our church here in Portage that the most quoted Old Testament prophecy was Psalm 110 in the New Testament. The one they quoted from the Old more than anything was Psalm 110 and 1. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And this vision is showing Jesus going to that throne. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad he's up in glory right now? King of kings and Lord of lords. Brother Murdoch, did your congregation ever sing that? He sits high above the mountain, King of kings and Lord is he, and all power is his forever. He still reigns. An empty grave is there to prove death could never hold our king. He still reigns and he still reigns. Hallelujah, Jesus. Amen. And that's what Revelation, but can you see how Exodus patterns that out? But that's nothing yet. Wait till you keep reading. After Moses goes to Egypt and becomes ruler, a lot of time passes, and then finally he tries to deliver Israel out of Egypt. He kills one Egyptian soldier, and then when he's rebuking a couple of Hebrew brothers that are fighting with each other, Moses thinks he's the big deliverer and says, okay, you guys stop it, you're Hebrew brothers. Come on, I'm a Hebrew too, you're Hebrew brothers. And then they say, are you gonna, you're gonna kill us like you did the Egyptian? And when Moses realized Pharaoh knew, he runs and escapes, and he's out there for 40 years. But then remember the burning bush, hallelujah. Remember, God speaks to him, now you're going to do it. God knocked that pride out of Moses, and now he's ready. And how do they escape Egypt? There's nine plagues, including water turning to blood, uh, the dust turning to lice, Thickness so, darkness so thick, rather, you could feel it. And the hail that turned into fire, the frogs, all of these things. And none of them brought Israel out of Egypt. And I think God did that on purpose because the last one, the 10th plague, how many remember when God was said, put blood of the lamb around your doorways. And when I see the blood, I'm going to pass over you. Hallelujah. And Moses had warned Pharaoh long before that. He said, you let Israel go because Israel is God's firstborn son. And if you touch God's firstborn, God's going to touch your firstborn. And that's exactly what God did. After nine plagues, giving Pharaoh a chance to humble himself, giving him a chance again and again and again. And he actually repents at one point, and then he goes back into anger again. Next plague, he repents again, then goes into anger. And then nine times until God says, okay, now I'm going to do what I told you at the beginning. Moses, tell him to put the blood of the lamb around the doors. And the blood of the lamb broke the back of Pharaoh. It killed his firstborn like God warned him he was going to do if he didn't let Israel go. And that was the straw. That was the plague that broke the camel's back. Aren't you glad the blood of Jesus Christ breaks the back of the devil? Hallelujah. Nothing but the blood, praise God. Satan hates the blood of Jesus Christ. And that plague broke the enemy's stronghold and kingdom just like in Passover. And so, then after they escape, how many remember the story? Pharaoh says, what did I do? I just let them go. He said, let's go after them. And he pursued the people. Now, somebody tell me right now, where did they go when they left Egypt? Where did they escape to? Somebody bring a microphone up and just mention it. Because it has a lot to do with this detail. Wilderness. Exactly. Think of this. They go out of Egypt into the wilderness. And in Jesus' day, time passed as well after he went to that throne. Revelation was written after Jesus already went to the throne. And he escapes the death of Herod. He dies and resurrects and then ascends to heaven to go to the throne. Israel, when they went into the wilderness, they went for 40 years feeding on manna, and Pharaoh chased after them. Look at how Revelation picks that up. And the woman, remember she's Israel? 
the, the 12 stars, the sun and the moon, the woman flees into the wilderness. Exact same story, where she's got a place prepared of God that they should feed her there, but they feed her not 40 years, it's 1,203 score days. 1,260 days, three and a half years. Now keep that in mind, because I'm going to bring that up later. And then there's war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. In other words, when Jesus went to that throne, the devil couldn't do nothing about it, and the Lord just threw him down. Remember when Job had a, a, a vision from God where God told him that it said that uh, the devil was among the sons of God. And God said, Satan, what are you here for? He said, I'm going to and fro throughout the earth to find people that aren't serving you. And he says, have you considered my servant Job? See how Satan kind of was before God in heaven and, and pointing his finger and said, he's only serving you because you're blessing him. You take away his blessings and he'll turn his back on you. So he's accusing us as accuser of the brethren before God. But when this war happens, it says he didn't have that place anymore. Hallelujah. You know, I believe, Brother Murdoch, something changed in the heavenlies and in the spiritual realm when Jesus went to that throne because he threw the devil down and said, my blood is redeeming and remitting everybody's sins and you've got nothing to point your finger at anymore like you did with Job. Because when you keep reading, it says the angels fought against the dragon and the dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not, neither was their place found anymore in heaven and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil. Now we know who the dragon is, it's the devil. And Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God. How many remember the first prayer request in the Lord's Prayer? Does anybody remember the Lord's Prayer, what the first request is that you and I are supposed to pray for? Amen. Turn the mic on and see if you can answer this. First prayer request. Go, let the Lord's Prayer go over in your mind. Anybody got it? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Here it is. Thy kingdom come. Right? That's the first prayer request. Well, look what happened when the devil was cast out. It says, now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God. The kingdom come. Hallelujah. I wrote a book on all this prophecy and called it, Thy Kingdom Came. <laughs> because this happened when Jesus went to the throne. He threw the devil down. Hallelujah. And the kingdom has come. How many know you've got to be born of the water and born of the spirit to get into the kingdom? And if we've got to be born of the water and spirit to get into the kingdom, well, the kingdom must have come. No one would be able to be born of the water and the spirit if the kingdom wasn't here. And what did Paul say the kingdom was? Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Oh man, the devil hates that because he knows it threw him out of glory so he couldn't even accuse. He was the devil long before that, but he was up there accusing Job and he's accusing this one and that one. But when this happened and Jesus went to the throne, no more place for you, devil. And remember, look what it says. And they overcame him. Well, wait, I missed this part. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down which accused them before our God day and night, like he did with Job. And why? The, they overcame him, the brethren. The accuser of the brethren was just mentioned. So when you read the word they, they is referring to the brethren, the church. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb, just like Israel overcame Pharaoh by the blood of the lamb around their doorways and broke his back and they got out of Egypt. We got out of bondage, praise God, when we got saved, the blood of Jesus set us free. And you know how the blood was around the doorway? I remember the Lord showed me this back in the 90s sometime. The blood's around the doorway. 
and you walk through doors, right? And the blood had to come from a lamb that was killed. So you got a dead lamb's blood that you're walking through for God to save you from death. Jesus said, I'm the door. Hallelujah. No man cometh to the Father but by me. And Jesus was the Lamb. John the Baptist said, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. How does he take it away? His blood. His blood. So when you go through a door with Lamb's blood around it, it's like you're getting inside of the dead Lamb. And know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. You get into the death of Jesus. And that's what walking through that blood-stained doorway represents. So when the devil comes by and he wants to bring death, there's already been a death for you. You're inside. But the lamb's blood was shed for you. And that death stood like your death. And the devil's defeated by the blood of the lamb. Hallelujah. Whenever the devil comes at you, folks, just say in the name of Jesus, by the blood of the lamb, I rebuke you. I bind you. You can't touch me, Satan, because I'm inside of Christ. Hallelujah. And I get in him when he died. And I stayed in him when he was buried. And I'm in him and risen with him. I am dead. I'm buried and risen with him. And I'm even seated with him in heavenly places. And when you go after the devil with that in your mind and he tries attacking you, you're going to have so much confidence and faith he hasn't got a chance. So let's get back here and watch how this leads up to the mark. So they overcame him by the blood. Therefore, rejoice you heavens and you that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, because the devils come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows he's got but a short time. And when the dragon saw, here we go. When the dragon saw, he was cast into the earth. He persecuted the woman. Now, who's the woman again? Israel, right? He persecuted the woman, which brought forth the man-child. Now, if Jesus is that man-child, and he went to that throne, and as soon as he's got on that throne, it burst out and exploded a war. And Israel goes into a time in the wilderness. And then the devil chases after her to persecute her. Look at how that lines up with Exodus. In Exodus 14 and 5, Israel's in the wilderness now. And it says in verse 5, it was told the king of Egypt that the people fled. And the heart of Pharaoh and his servants was turned against the people. And they said, Why have we done this, that we've let Israel go from serving us? And he made ready his chariot, and took his people with him. And he took six hundred chosen chariots, all the chariots of Egypt, captains, every one of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and he pursued after the children, just like the dragon chases the woman in Revelation. And the Egyptians pursued, went in after them in the midst of the sea. Remember the Red Sea was opened up? Here come the chariots, right through that same Red Sea. Even all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And it came to pass that in the morning watch, the Lord looked unto the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and cloud. God was in that pillar of fire and cloud and troubled the host of the Egyptians, and took off their chariot wheels, drave them heavily, so that the Egyptians said, Let's flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fighteth for them against the Egyptians. And the Lord said to Moses, Now, Moses, take your rod, quick, stretch it out over your sea, over the Red Sea, that the waters may come again on the Egyptians, on their chariots, on their horsemen. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea. The sea returned to strength when the morning appeared, and the Egyptians fled against it, and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea, and the waters returned and covered the chariots, you know the story, the horsemen, all the host, and it said not one of them remained. When Moses later worships God, watch this. This is going to be shown you in Revelation. They're worshiping God, and God tells them how he carried Israel on eagle's wings and how the earth swallowed up the armies of Egypt. Look at this in Exodus 15 and 12. You stretched out your right hand, Moses talking to God. The earth swallowed them. 
I want to repeat this two times because you need to watch this. The earth swallowed them. Notice the language, swallowing. The earth is swallowing these Egyptian soldiers when the Red Sea covered them. And then in verse 4 of chapter 19, you've seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bear you on eagle's wings. So look at these two details. The earth swallows the Egyptians when the Red Sea covered them up. And God takes Israel and bears them on eagle's wings and brings them to himself. Swallowing the Egyptians, God bearing Israel on eagle's wings. Look at Revelation 12 and 14. To the woman were given two wings of a great eagle. <laughs> Hallelujah. Just like Israel, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place. Just like Israel got the manna, she's nourished for a time, times, and half a time, three and a half years, from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water like a flood out of the, after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood. The exact same two details that were said about Egypt being swallowed by the earth in the Red Sea, and God giving Israel eagle's wings. It said about the woman and the dragon. I mean, by this time, I said, oh God, I hope you're leading me up to now about the mark of the beast, because every detail is lining up so perfectly. And God said, you keep on studying this. I'm going to show you what the mark is. And so I, I just was unbelievable at this point. I could not get over how God was showing this out. And Moses comes down from the mount with the law. Remember, we went up to Mount Sinai, and he got the Ten Commandments. That's the law. And God told him, Moses, the people are making a golden calf, and they're worshiping it. Here's where he says it, Exodus 32 and 1. Now we're getting to the parallel with the beast in Revelation. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, ah, Make us gods, which shall go before us. Because this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what's become of him. And Aaron said, Break off the golden earrings that are in the ears of your wives, your sons, your daughters, bring them to me. And all the people break off the golden earrings. And look at verse 4, what I've got in yellow letters. They made a molten calf. And Aaron, they built an altar. I won't read all those details. They offered burnt offerings. They were worshiping a golden calf, right? And he says, they've turned aside quickly out of the way, Moses, which I commanded them. They made themselves a golden calf and worshiped it. Revelation 13. The beast is deceiving people that dwell on the earth by the means of miracles that he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell in the earth, they should make an image to the beast, just like the earth swallowed up the dragon and his armies, and the earth swallowed up this dragon back in Exodus, the earth swallows it again in Revelation. And the woman Israel is given two great wings of an eagle, and Israel in Revelation is given two great wings. And even after that, when the people worship the golden calf, a golden calf is an image of a beast. And you get now the image of the beast in both Exodus and Revelation. And we're coming up to what the mark is. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, this was when Moses got that law. Chapter 6, remember the Ten Commandments? Moses reads them out here in chapter 6 and verse 2. He, and he says, He gave them the law that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God, keep his statutes and commandments which I command thee, thou, your son, your son's son, all the days of your life, and that the days may be prolonged. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it. Now watch if you can catch something about something similar to the mark that it may be well with thee, and that you may increase mightily, as the Lord God of your fathers hath promised thee, in the land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, here's the great first commandment. The Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God, with all thine heart and soul and might, 
and these words which I command you shall be in your heart. Now, what we're going to read here is nothing evil like the mark of the beast is evil. But Satan always counterfeits what God does. You got the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost in the New Testament? How many know Jesus? Well, you got the dragon, the false prophet, and the image of the beast. See? In the book of Revelation, the devil's got his counterfeit. And it says, these words that I command you this day, they need to be in your heart. And teach them diligently to your children and talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. And look at this. Bind them for a sign upon thy hand. And they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. Between your eyes, folks, is your forehead. That's what it's talking about. God's law, which is a good law, was to be bound to the hand and on the forehead. And the devil didn't like it. Watch what happens. And in Revelation 13 and 16, the beast causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And what you're reading is just like God wanted to be worshipped at Mount Sinai, the devil had them worship an image of the beast. And just like God should be worshipped in Revelation, the devil had them worshipping an image of the beast. And like God's law was on your forehead and on your hand, because your forehead represents your will. I'm going to show you scriptures of that. Your right hand represents your power. The devil has his law to counterfeit that, and it's on people's foreheads instead of God's law. And it's on people's right hand instead of God's law. And the Lord showed me, see, the mark of the beast is a counterfeit to God's ways and God's law. Spiritually speaking, we need to have something from God on our foreheads and something from God on our right hands, not a mark of the beast or a name of the beast. And how many have ever seen a picture of this before? Wave your hand if you've seen this. You seen this? They're called phylacteries. The Jews take those boxes, they're boxes. And that scripture I read to you in Deuteronomy, that's inside that box. There's one from Exodus. There's another one, a couple, there's about three or four places where God said, put it on your forehead and on your hand. And the Jews will put these into these boxes and look at what they do with them. They put them on their foreheads and they wrap them on their arm and put it on their arm. And the Lord showed me, son, man, I feel the Holy Ghost. Just like every detail in that pattern of Exodus is seen in Revelation. The mark of the beast is the devil's answer and the devil's counterfeit of God's law. It's not a silly computer chip. It's not a COVID vaccine. That's ridiculous when you let the Bible interpret the Bible like we've just done with Revelation and Exodus, seeing the exact same pattern go through there, you realize God's trying to show us what the real mark of the beast is. It's the devil's counterfeit of the ways of God. Now when Moses, and that wasn't all, when Moses came down, he demanded everybody to separate that were worshiping the image of the beast. Get away from them. Get away from the calf. And the Levites came and stood by Moses. Remember that? Now what Moses, what mountain was Moses on? Mount Sinai. Watch this. The same pattern happens in Revelation. Here's Exodus. Moses stood in the gate of the camp. He just come down from Mount Sinai. Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves unto him. And after you read that people were worshiping the image of the beast and wearing the mark, so to speak, in Revelation, there's another group of people, just like the Levites stood with Moses, there's a group of people in Revelation 14 standing with the Lamb. <laughs> Two, just two verses after the mark of the beast. Look what Revelation 14 and 1 says. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, not Mount Sinai where Moses was. Ever read Revelation, or rather Hebrews 12, where it says, 
God spoke on earth at Mount uh, Sinai, but now he speaks from heaven. And we've come to Mount Zion. Hallelujah. Here you've got a lamb instead of Moses standing on Mount Zion instead of Sinai. And with him, just like with Moses, 144,000 having his father's name written where? In their foreheads. Two verses after the mark of the beast is on people's foreheads, the father's name is on these people's foreheads. Remember I said, we don't need the mark of the beast on our forehead or on our hand. We need something from God. Well, that's something from God, folks, is the name of the Father. Hallelujah. How many know the name of the Son, the name of the Holy Ghost? How many know Jesus is on our foreheads? In fact, in Revelation chapter 3, when he's talking to the church of Philadelphia, I'll write upon you my new name. Hallelujah. The name of the city of my God and my new name. We get Jesus' name because our foreheads represent our will. And we're going to do the will of Jesus. Our right hands got the name of Jesus on them because our works and our power and all our efforts are going to do the work for Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. But the devil has his people who are doing the devil's will with his beast name in their foreheads and on their hands because their power is going to fulfill the works of the devil. And if, if the mark of the beast is a computer chip, then two verses later, doesn't that mean the father's name on the forehead should be a computer chip too? <laughs> is, is the father's name on the forehead a godly vaccine where the mark of the beast is a COVID vaccine and there's a godly virus God wants us to get instead of the COVID virus? See how ridiculous it is to say that the vaccine is the mark of the beast? When you compare Bible with Bible and God says, my law is going to be on your foreheads and my law is going to be on your hands. That's the will and that's your power. Hallelujah. And love the Lord your God with all your might, with all your soul and all your heart. Right hand, forehead and spirit, your heart. Whatever the father's name on the foreheads refers to, Satan's counterfeit mark of the beast on the foreheads is something spiritual too. Oh, see Moses, watch this, coming down to a close now. Moses calls for people to stand by his side. And this is all the Levites come. And he sends them, he said, now you go and slay all the others that are still worshiping that calf. And 3,000 died that day by the edge of the sword. Similarly, in Revelation 14, after the 144,000 come to the side of the Lamb, Babylon is fallen. Look at the words here. Exodus 32 and 28. The children of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and their what? Fell. Usually at church I say, everybody say fell. Maybe on everybody put your microphone and say fell. <laughs> Hallelujah. Fell. And of the people, 3,000 men died. Look at what Revelation does after the Lamb has these people come to his side in verse 7 in chapter 14. Saying with a loud voice, Fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgments come. Worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea. Don't worship this image of the beast. Worship God. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen. Exact same pattern. All the way from Moses being born and Jesus being born. Right through to the massacre where Pharaoh's trying to kill all the babies to get Moses. And Herod's trying to kill all the babies to get Jesus. And Moses goes into Egypt and Jesus goes into Egypt. And then it zooms up into the fast forward into the future. And Jesus goes up into glory and sits on the throne. And Moses goes up to the throne in Egypt. And then Israel comes out of Egypt by the blood of the Lamb. And the blood of the Lamb causes the woman to overcome, the church to overcome the devil. And then they go to Mount Sinai, and God says, put the law of God on your forehead and on your hand. And the beast is being worshipped in an image, and he's got something instead of God's law for foreheads and hands. And then all of a sudden, it's like 
Moses is on Mount Sinai like Jesus is on Mount Zion. And the 144,000, folks, is 12 times 12. Amen. Times 1,000. That's a symbolic number. The 12 apostles, the 12 tribes of Israel, Old Testament, New Testament, multiply it by 1,000. And you've got the people of God. That's the church it's talking about. Hallelujah. And all of them are with Jesus. And they don't have any mark of the beast on their foreheads or hands. They've got the name of the Father. And how many know what his name is? Praise God. And then those people worshiping the idol, they're fallen. 3,000 fell. And Babylon, Babylon is fallen in the book of Revelation. And the third angel followed saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast in his image, receive his mark in their forehead or hand, the same is going to drink of the wine of the wrath of God. And we've been a long time, brother. I could bring this down and in closing, watch this. Nero Caesar. Remember John was told shortly this stuff's going to come to pass? Well, it was just shortly after this, before the people that heard Jesus say, every stone in this temple is going to be unturned. Before they saw that happen in AD 70, Nero became emperor. And if you take his name in Hebrew, Neron Kesser would be the Hebrew. It adds up to 666. Nero Caesar is Neron Kesser. And all those letters add up to 666. Every letter in the Hebrew alphabet's got a number to it. People, you ever heard people take English names? I remember they took Ronald Wilson Reagan when Pre President Reagan in the United States was president in the 80s. Ronald has six letters. Wilson has six letters. Reagan has six letters, 666. That's the English language. We're dealing with Jews. We're dealing with Hebrews. And Nero Caesar in Hebrew means, adds up to 666. And it's shortly after John wrote that. And there's the letters. And if you take it into Latin, how many know the Catholics have a Latin Bible? In Latin, instead of 666, it says 616. But if you were to take that and write it in Latin, you take the N away at the end of Nero Kessar's name, and it adds up to 616. So if you're reading it in Latin, it would be Nero. If you're reading it in Hebrew, it would be Nero. And you talk about the mark of the beast, this, never forget this. And everybody asks you about the mark of the beast. In ancient Rome, they had what they called an agora. And an agora was like a mall. And it was a public place in the Greek cities and states and all around Rome. And it meant a gathering place or assembly. Athletes would go there, artists, religious people, and politicians from the city. And you could not get in there unless you burned incense and said, Caesar is Lord. And they gave you a paper proven that you sacrificed to a false god. Or else you couldn't buy in there or you couldn't sell. Folks, that's history. That happened way back shortly after John wrote of this stuff. And people don't know that. And they see the computer chips and they think that's the mark or they see COVID vaccines. And it's all ridiculous because none of it is about worshiping a man. But Caesar demanded people worship him like a god. This happened 2,000 years ago and people don't know it. And they think all this stuff happening now is the mark of the beast.